Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> this is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the one-year anniversary of the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. Happy New Year, by the way. We were wondering uh, last week between ourselves, why did we wait till the 5th of January to start doing it? Right. Now we get it. It was Based on the holiday. how the holiday, the first of the year fell, and then there was the weekend, just as we took uh, the holiday time off. And so the first broadcast of the year is now on the 5th. And we've made our way to the book of Deuteronomy now today, chapter 14. And in this chapter, I, the, the question that I want to, to posit, to pose in this chapter is, should we reject the Old Testament? Now, you know, and you have a, a knee-jerk reaction to that, to that as well, of, of course not, but yet, you know, it's like the spirit of Antichrist. The Bible says in 1 John 4 that the spirit of Antichrist denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Uh, but uh, And we say, well, I would never deny that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, but that's a whole lot more than a historical reference. We're not just denying that he came 2,000 years ago, was born of Mary. There's a lot of people that believe that historically, but they functionally deny him. If I deny Jesus Christ in you, I'm denying he's coming to your flesh, and that's the spirit of Antichrist. And it's the, it's the same way we're going to see about sometimes our relationship to the Old Testament uh, is it may not be a formal rejection that we would say, no, I don't believe in the Old Testament, but we functionally neglect and thereby deny uh, what the fundamentalists would call the whole counsel of God. So should we reject the Old Testament? In this chapter, you're going to see that Moses reiterates various laws including dietary laws. Are we subject to the dietary laws of the Old Testament? You know, if there's one area where people get legalistic, it has to do with their food. They don't think they can lose weight or be in good health unless they get legalistic and rigid about their diet. But let's remember the Bible says that all things can be received with rejoicing because they're received in faith, and uh, there is a grace dimension uh, to good health. That doesn't mean you can eat uh, five pounds of uh, Breyer's ice cream and uh, expect to be fit. That's not the point. But the point is, you have to put your faith. If we are in good shape, and we talk about this the first of the year because everybody makes resolutions, I want to lose weight in the first of the year. Well, if we do it according to a rigid, legalistic, hardcore approach and not by faith, then it doesn't please God because the scripture says without faith, no man can, can see God, no man can, can please God. Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. And so, uh, and this, of course, is not talking about losing weight. It's talking about specific things that we're allowed to eat and things that we were not allowed to eat under the old covenant economy of God. What value do the scriptures, if any, what value do they have that outline dietary laws? Are we obligated to dietary laws? Uh, there are believers that think we do. But we have to remember, go read Acts chapter 15. We put all these expectations and laws written and unwritten about what makes a good Christian. <laughs> if you're a Christian, you have to do these things. Uh, but go to Acts chapter 15, and you will see that the, the requirements, when they were deciding whether or not Gentiles could be allowed in the church of the living God, uh, they had a major dispute because there were those that said they mu that Gentiles must obey the law of Moses. They must obey, you know, know how long of a Sabbath day's journey is and all of these things and obey the dietary laws. But at the end of the matter, 
they made uh, two demands upon the believers that were not of Jewish extraction. They said they should abstain from things strangled and from blood. So there's two dietary expectations. Um, and abstain from fornication. Isn't that it? Fornication is the word pornea. And uh, it had to do with um, pornography. Prostitution was a form of worship in the Gentile world. You even see that when you read in First and Second Corinthians that it was a holy Gentile church for the most part. And they crossed some lines in that area that Paul had to come in and correct. You do a deep enough study, you will, you will see that. Uh, Gentile DNA, Gentile culture, going back thousands of years, is very hedonistic. And, and we're no, our culture is no different. Western culture is Gentile uh, culture. And if there's one thing that we should be emphasizing, we emphasize a whole lot of things. You know, be in church every time the doors are open, pay your tithe down to the last penny, uh, be sure and volunteer for the church. Uh, and all of these things that are required that we think makes a good Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, don't smoke, don't chew, j don't go out with girls that do, don't go in. I mean, when I grew up, the, the idea is if the rapture took place and you were in the movie house uh, watching a movie, the rapture would take place that nobody sitting in a theater was going to make it to heaven. Nobody in a roller skating rink was going to make it to heaven. We wow. could laugh at that now. Wow. But let me tell you something, that was in, the, that was in my belly uh, growing, growing up. And what are the requirements of God? And that whole thing, abstaining from fornication, that has a broad connotation in a media-driven culture that's all about using gender-based attraction to drive a retail economy. Mm -hmm. And it's on the programming, it's on the news broadcasts, it's in the commercials. Uh, it is a big part, and it's a constant assault. You know, God gives us a book in, printed on rice paper and bound in leather, and the world comes at us with a 42-inch flat screen, ultra-high definition suggestiveness. And I'm not saying you can't have a television. It's like people say, let's do a Facebook fast. Well, that's like saying let's do an electricity fast because, you know, we, we want to focus on God, so let's turn off the electricity for a month and uh, let's put an outhouse outside. We're going to fast from indoor plumbing for a month. That's technology. It's part of the world we live in. We have to know how to be in that world and not be of it and go out and take the territory and use the one thing about the Internet, pornography has exploded uh, uh, through the internet because I used to tell people the internet is not evil in itself it just simply allows people to do easily more and more uh, proficiently that which they were already prone to do otherwise there was a day that that you you'd have to go to some trouble to get those illicit images uh, but nowadays it's a it's a click away but just like the world has taken advantage and the church was so slow to come to technology and still today they still have not established a beachhead in uh, the information age we're still having church and holding court in spiritual things the way we did in the middle ages when people lived and died were born lived and died within five miles of their birthplace but we're taking the realm of technology. That's part of our mission, part of what God's called Father's Heart Ministry to do. We didn't intend to be groundbreakers, but you know, I don't see too many people doing things the way we do them. We're not better. I think we've just ahead. We've, we've through a set of circumstances, and it's not because we sat down eight years ago and say, uh, let's get ahead of everybody else. No, we you didn't know? know what we were doing. <laughs> But so, God's doing it. <laughs> so what about the dietary laws? Do we have to give up bacon? Uh, do we simply discard the Old Testament if with the dietary laws don't apply? Do we throw away the, the Old Testament? What place does the Old Testament, the laws of Moses, hold in our lives? Many struggle with this and fall into the error of Jewish religion. And that's big. It's big on the east coast of the United States and on the west coast as well, where people allow themselves to be... Uh, drawn in to some stylized version of 
what the Messianic Christianity, and I'm, and, and I, I'm not full, uh, an authority on Messianic Christianity, but I know I've seen some, and I've counseled a lot of people struggling with legalism based on the charismatic Christian version of Messianic uh, Judaism. And uh, uh, surely that's not everybody's testimony, but I've dealt with a lot of people who have struggled with that. It's not God's plan. Uh, others reject the Old Testament altogether. Well, in this study, we're going to see the appropriate and, in fact, deep relevance in our life in Christ that the Old Testament and Moses' laws have for us. So, Kitty, if you would begin by reading the first two verses. Okay, Deuteronomy 14.1. Ye are the children of the Lord your God. Ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead, for thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Now, one thing about determining when you look at the laws, the statutes, and the commandments, uh, the Old Testament says thou shalt not lie. Now, since we're in Christ, is it okay for us to lie? If we don't have to obey, if we can have bacon and it, we don't have to obey the dietary laws, then I guess we don't have to obey the Ten Commandments, do we? The traditional understanding, and I believe it's something that bears merit. I don't know that it's, you're not saved if you don't believe this, but for me, if I look at one of the laws expressed in the Old Testament, if it has a moral component to it, if there is a moral, there's nothing, there's no moral component to don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. Do not sew wool and linen fibers together. If we were to obey that, we'd have to all get our entire 90% of our wardrobe and go get go get rid of it uh, and throw it in the in the dumpster because it's not according to the uh, laws relating to textiles and clothing in the Old Testament. Some of those laws have a moral component. Some of them do not. But even the ones that seem to be trivial and and what possibly could that mean to us today, they do have meaning for us as we're going to see. And here it talks about no tattoos, no mohawks, you know, this, no unibrows and such you know, shape, but don't yeah, shape it's talking you. about people. You ever see people that they they'll put their their initials in their hair, how they cut their hair and they use their hair as a statement and of course isn't that what we do in a hedonistic society media driven where sex sells and uh, same thing when we put tattoos on our body we're making a statement is it wrong to have a tattoo i'll tell you my story when i was in the military i was not a very good guy and i was stationed in washington state and i got drunk and i headed off to the waterfront seattle washington went down found this uh, tattoo parlor next to a bar and uh, I was ready to get my tattoo. Papa Russ. I was going to put a big <laughs> Hello Kitty right on my chest. That's no, not, that's before you That's not true. Knew. That was before. That was that was BK before Kitty. <laughs> uh, no, I was going to put a butterfly on my arm, and I, and they wouldn't do it because number one, I was three sheets to the wind. Number two, I was underage. I was not 21, and that's what you had to be in the state of Washington. Thank God. Uh, right. Just from an aesthetic standpoint, for me. Now, this is just Russ talking. This is not. I'm not establishing right. doctrine, but I've never seen a tattoo 20 years out that looked as good as the day it was gotten. Right. Better get a Hannah one. And I just, <laughs> just never been able to buy uh, into that. But, uh, and this is a clear cut. You don't cut yourself. You don't mark yourself. You don't tattoo your body. And notice it said they did it for the dead. And now, does that apply to us today? Does that have a moral value? And if we don't have to obey, don't you go mess with my earring. <laughs> I was if pointing we, at his, his diamond <laughs> earring and his earlobe. <laughs> if, if, we, if, we, you know, if, if we have to obey the Ten Commandments, then surely we have to obey this too, right? <laughs> uh, well, there's not a moral component there, is there? But let's see what this will tell us. The practice of cutting for the dead and getting tattoos was an Amorite practice. And this is one of the first nations that uh, Moses led the Israelites in battle against as they prepared to go into the promised land. The Amorites practiced self-mutilation. Yeah. Their name means 
the Amorites, the name means to say, to say. And their king, his name meant uh, with haste. And so this is dealing with fast talkers. When a fast talker is coming at you, he's trying to sell you something. Have you ever been uh, around the people that are trying to sell you a timeshare? Mm -hmm. They talk so fast. Or if you're down and we did, uh, we were in Nevada and we were in Las Vegas uh, doing some ministry and you're walking down the street and you got guys out there who talk so fast trying to make you pause that you have to, when you're going to move into your promised land, you're going to have some Amorites to deal with, some fast talkers who are going to say, if you do this, which will always benefit them, it's going to fast track you into your destiny. Mm. And so you got to get past the fast talkers. I, I, I've told people for years as a pastor, every time I baptize somebody, I would say, now look, I'd give them their baptismal certificate. And I said, within two weeks, you're going to be visited by, by two groups of fast talkers on 10-speed bicycles with long white sleeve shirts. And they're going to want to be pushing their book at you that think they know more than Jesus because the enemy sends the fast talkers to those that are about to break out into their into their oh. blessing. And what are they doing? They're wanting to engrave upon you. They're wanting to stamp upon you their mission, their statement, their value. you got to get past the fast talkers. And now that you get past them, then Moses turns around and says, now that we've defeated them, don't be like them. Mm -hmm. See, we do that in church. How that, you know, Hitler, one of the things that, that made Nazi Germany so strong is he spent two generations raising up from infants that he took away from their parents and he raised up vicious Nazi killers as he as he generated that regime of, of death because he knew if he got the kids he could control the culture well how many times have we heard pastors say that I know myself behind closed doors if you get the kids you've got the parents they're being like the Amorites do not reproduce we don't want to be overrun by the fast-talking con men of life. Don't become that as the people of God. Come on. <laughs> See, the Amorite, it, it means to say. A tattoo is definitely making a statement. Making conspicuous marks between the eyes was also prohibited. Eyes have to do with vision and communication. It is said that the eyes are the windows of the soul. To place a mark between your eyes is like putting a billboard up on the freeway. You're making a statement. Uh, it's message related. And they did all these things for the dead. Mm. Isn't that interesting? And isn't that kind of what we do? We're going to get into that. Setting aside the actual marking of one's body, what's the deeper meaning? Jesus said in Mark 12, 27, that God is not a God of the dead, but a God of the living. Where is The whole point is, where's your identity? Where is your identity? What's your is your identity in um, uh, outward things such as your physical appearance? Is your identity invested in outward things such as religious culture, or maybe the culture of your uh, generation? I remember in the '60s, and Kitty will remember it too. The strong uh, hold, the deep, visceral, core, deep uh, uh, statement, vision statement mission statement of the 60s culture was don't trust anybody over 30. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? They all turned 31. <laughs> and Oops. suddenly, and suddenly, you know, the, we had to we had to rearrange our thinking. What where what where is our identity? What gospel are we preaching? If you look deep enough at the origins of the popular gospel emphasis, you'll find many core values and messages that have nothing to do with the Bible. Things that say, if you don't believe this, you're going to hell. And they arise from the writings of men like Schofield, Spurgeon, Calvin, Clarence Larkin, and many others. If you're not a student of Scripture, you're not going to know that. As modern belief systems develop, the teachings of these men, again, cutting yourself for the dead, shaping your vision statement, your image, and your life message, around a dead guy. Hmm. It's the same thing, a perfect example. Uh, Sunday school is not what it once was. But yet there are people that will strongly tell you if you're not going to Sunday school, you are in jeopardy of your soul. Now you laugh, oh, but the, some of you that's been around the teacup long enough to find a handle, you know that's true. 
They've codified the whole idea of Sunday school. And but you need to understand where Sunday school came from. A dead guy by the name of Moody was raised up by God during the Industrial Revolution when children were working 18 hours a day, six days a week. Mm -hmm. And he was raised up by God to retrieve these children who were being ground up like in a meat grinder of, of modern industry, of the emerging industrial age, to redeem these children out of that situation and to recover them, and it was absolutely vital. Well, let me tell you something. Kids are not working 18 hours a day, six days a week, are they? No, they're sitting in front of computers. They're playing Nintendo, mm -hmm. okay? It's a different culture, but we so codified that that it became a whole basis of doctrine, and you're not a good Christian if you're not going to Sunday school, and we are so out of touch with what's going on. Same thing, I remember, hey, I homeschooled to, uh, my children. Two of my kids, I homeschooled myself <laughs> that uh, through uh, up to high school years, and then they went through high school. Two of my other kids, I homeschooled completely all the way K through 12. And I wrote my own curriculum. And I learned how to do that whole thing while I was running two businesses and conducting my life. Uh, and uh, so I believed in homeschool, but there I would be in, in meetings where they would say, if your kids are not being homeschooled, you're not a good Christian. I said, excuse me, point of order. What are you talking about? Because that is idolatry. It's, it's laying hold of this statement that if you're not doing this, and there's even groups, charismatic groups that say, if you're not having your children at home, it's not God. You have to have home, birth, uh, even if you have a midwife, that's not faith. You just need to go and... Some of you that have been around, you know what I'm talking about, listening to this. You've heard it, and, you, and you've seen it. What are they doing? They're, they're looking at something outward, this outward, cultural, religious conformity. This is what makes you a good Christian. No, you got to look a whole lot deeper than that. As modern belief systems developed, the teachings of these men was codified into textbooks of theology and made the basis of faith as though all scriptural inquiry stops there. Clarence Larkin figured this all out. Edward Irving figured this all out. Schofield, Spurgeon, Calvin, they, they got all this down. We don't need to look past their conclusions to inquire into the scriptures as to the verities of gospel truth. And so what are we doing? We're adopting a vision statement, a mission statement, that is honoring the dead, not honoring the scripture. Who's with me? I, I, I trust you get the point that, I, that I'm making. There's a reason why these things are in the scripture, because we are a body. You talk about marking your body. We are a body. We are the body of Christ. Yeah. Are we marking ourselves for the dead? <laughs> See, the life message of these men becomes an identifying characteristic for different denominations, thus cutting themselves for the dead. In other words, I'm going to cut you out because you don't believe what Luther believed. Mm -hmm. I'm going to cut you out because you don't believe what Wesley believed. I'm going to cut you out because you don't chew Copenhagen. Hello? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Copenhagen is what he's referring to. <laughs> See, cutting ourselves, defining ourselves by that which does not give life in order to make a belief statement. God wants us to learn to hold the teachings of man loosely in order to maintain our identity in him. Because truth is where you find it. I remember the day was, and you, you'll laugh at me, but as a baby pastor, I was very naive. I believed in the 16 tenets of the Assemblies of God faith, and I thought that if you believed in those 16 tenets, you would be in the Assemblies of God. And if you were not in the Assemblies of God, it's because you didn't believe those things. And I believe those things were true. So if you didn't believe those things, you were deceived. And if you were deceived, you were not saved. So you had to be in the Assemblies of God to be saved. Yes. And I know that's that's sound. You would laugh at me. You're laughing at me. And I <laughs> laugh now, too. Giggling. <laughs> but I had a dear friend who was an Assembly of God minister, or I wouldn't have been listening to him who would bring me little tapes by Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, mm. Bob Mumford, Ern Baxter, Derek Prince. And these guys were in it. Matter of fact, their names were on white papers being denounced by the Assemblies of God that now says they were the gentle womb nurturing these ministries in years past, which is anything but the truth. And I would listen to these guys, and they weren't espousing Assembly of God doctrine, but they were anointed. Oh, my goodness. Suddenly, I got my whole kingdom back. <laughs> Suddenly the kingdom of God got so much bigger that all these dead guys 
See? <laughs> Nelson <laughs> and different ones who I have those books on my shelf today. I study them. I appreciate them. But the kingdom of God's a whole lot bigger than that. You see, it's all about where's your identity? Cutting yourselves. Going to cut this one out. Going to mark this one. If you're not marked quite right, then you're not part of my thing. Uh, Isaiah 4.1 talks about this. It says, In that day seven women will lay hold upon one man, saying, We will eat our own bread, wear our own apparel, only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. But Jesus said in John 15, 4, abide in the vine. Find your identity in him. And see, truth is a person. He's the way, the truth, and the life. My doctrine can be true, but my truth is a person. His name is Jesus. And so seven women lay hold on one man. We'll, we'll eat our own bread, wear our own apparel. Just let us be called by thy name. I'm Lutheran. I'm Wesleyan. I'm Hagen. I'm mm-hmm. Copeland. I'm Redding. I'm, I'm uh, uh, this group. I'm prophetic. And we're trying to identify with something external, and we have a need to do that. And the need to have that identification that is external and narrower than the kingdom itself is a measurement of our lack of identity in Christ. Amen. And we have to, it's a measurement of our own immaturity. We're cutting ourselves for the dead. We're stamping ourselves with these with these images and we're branding ourselves Come on now. and this is really big because it, this is how religion uh, fosters and disseminates itself the church has taken a uh, page out of the world's playbook on how to get big and how to disseminate and grow itself organizationally and it does it by brand identification and, and to the degree that you and I are susceptible to that is a measurement of our own lack of, of identity in Christ. See, seven women, seven that's the seven churches laying hold on one man, Wesley, Luther, whoever, and saying, let us, let us be a part of your thing because we feel like we belong. What's the matter? Jesus isn't enough? Mm-hmm. That's what happened to Adam in the beginning. Absolutely. <laughs> See, John 15, 4, abiding in the vine. See, if you don't abide in the vine, verse 6 of John 15 says, men shall gather you and cast you into the fire. Aren't you tired of being uh, wood for the engine of somebody else's fire? That's one thing you will never be in Father's Heart Ministry. You are not cannon fodder for our vision. Thank you, God. You are not simply a resource to advance Russ and Kitty's deal. But Jesus said plainly, if you're not abiding in the vine, you are simply a resource being consumed. Men shall get, not angels, men shall gather you and cast you into the fire. It's not talking about hell. It's talking about what they're cooking up, Hmm. what they're doing. You're going to just simply be a commodity consumed by religious purpose to advance somebody else's agenda while they lie to you and tell you that's the kingdom of God. And brothers and sisters, it is not. And to the degree you fall for that is a measurement of your own immaturity and a lack of abiding in Christ. So let's shake that off. Let's just Amen. shake it off and come back to abiding in Christ. Amen. Even though that may have some little emptiness for us. Because all of a sudden, we don't have all those outward things to, to establish your identity. But you, that's where you find intimacy. Who's with me? We're with you. I know. Honey bunny. You know, some people can <laughs> listen to this and say, I don't understand a word that guy's saying. Mm, but our hearts know the yeah. truth. But it's so true. And the truth makes us free. Now, if you'd read verse today, we're going to talk about what you can and can't eat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Three uh, through Three what? through eight, uh, twenty. 3 through 20. Thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. These are the beasts which ye shall eat, the ox, the sheep, and the goat, the hart, the roe, the fallow deer, and the wild goat, the pygarg, and the wild ox, and the chamois, and every beast that parteth the hoof, and cleaveth the cleft into two claws, and cheweth the cud. Now now we're going to come back to that and just pay attention. (laughs) If they chew the cud and cleave the hoof, you can eat them. Just remember that, and we'll come back to that. That you shall eat. Verse 7, Nevertheless, these shall you not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the cloven hoof, as the camel, the hare, the coney, for they chew the cud, but divide not the hoof. Therefore they are unclean to you. And the swine, because it divided the hoof, yet cheweth not the cud, is unclean to you. Mm. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. 
These ye shall eat of all that are in the waters, all that have fins and scales shall you eat. You can eat those, but you can't have catfish. <laughs> All my southern constituency just tuned out. <laughs> Verse 10. And whatever hath not fins and scales, ye may not eat. It is unclean to you. Of all the birds ye shall eat, but they, these that are, they which shall not eat. The eagle and the ostrich, the uh, and the osprey, and the gleed, and the kite, and the vulture after his kind, and every raven after his kind, and the owl, and the nighthawk, and the Carrion eaters and predator birds. Isn't that interesting? And the cuckoo and the hawk after his kind, the little owl and the great owl and the swan, the pelican and the gear eagle and the cormorant, and the stork and the heron after her kind, and the lapwing and the bat. Oh, Ooh. we can't have bat oh. gumbo. And every, <laughs> every creeping thing that flieth is unclean unto you. They shall not be eaten. But of all the clean fowls you may eat. What do the dietary laws say to us? They are some of the most prominent features of the law. In the first centuries of the church, there was a heretic by the name of Marcion who established an alternative church that lasted for centuries. In the early church, a man by the name of Marcion, he completely rejected the Old Testament. Now, you need to know this. This is not just Bible trivia. This man named Marcion completely rejected the Old Testament. He rejected all of the epistles except for Paul and the four Gospels. That was his canon. He was actually the first guy to propose the idea of a canon. The canon is the 66 books of the Bible. And he said, oh, don't add to that. Don't take away. That's not talking about the 66 books of the Bible. I'm sorry to tell you. It's talking about the book of Revelation. Amen. But the idea of a canon originally came about by this man named Marcion, who he made a list of books that he accepted because he rejected completely the Old Testament and he did and he did not accept any of the New Testament books that were influenced by the Old Testament. So he only accepted the Gospels, specifically the Gospel of Luke, and the writings of Paul. Everything else he rejected. And, that, and so the whole idea of a canon of accepted books was actually begun by a complete heretic who rejected. You say, well, what are you saying? Well, I'm not. I'm making you think. <laughs> and, and in fact, there never was. We think that there was some point in ancient history that the churches got together, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Trent, some of these early councils that took place in the early centuries of the church where they acknowledged the 66 books of the Bible and closed the canon, the authoritative, this is it. No, that never happened. It never happened. Not in any of the century, early centuries of the church. They never came back. These, the 66 books that we acknowledge, are, were simply by common consensus, but not a perfect consensus, were acknowledged to be the 66 books of the Bible. Understand, it was common consensus, not perfect consensus, because the Alexandrian church, they leaned toward uh, one set of books. The Jerusalem church leaned toward another. The Antioch church toward another. Rome toward another. The city churches all emphasized maybe one particular gospel, and they didn't reject the others, but they just, they just simply leaned toward those that was their, that was their collection. And there's a, it's a whole story, and it's fascinating, but you need to get that. You need to come out of this tradition about the scriptures and begin to think about the scriptures in a manner that is accurate to truth, not accurate to religious uh, tradition. Now, uh, again, he completely rejected the Old Testament. Marcion believed that the Old Testament originated from a demon called Yahweh. Are you with me? Wow. Well. A demon called Yahweh who was not the father who sent Jesus. To him there were two demigods. There was a demon called Yahweh who uh, established the Old Testament. And then there was the father, the Logos, who sent Jesus. And his message, Marcion's message was much more amenable to the modern concept of liberal Christianity than it is. It, then we would be comfortable knowing. Okay, I, again, see, our, our security is not in an ideology. That's right. 
Our security is not in a religious ideology. Our security is in the person of Jesus. And yes, I may be trying to shake you a little bit, but I'm trying to shake you away from a false anchor so that you're anchored in the person of Jesus, not anchored in what you know or what you think you Come know. Come on, let's have that. See, we're shocked by this. Uh, well, I reject the Old Testament. Uh, but when was the last time you read the Old Testament? Or for that matter, even your Bible. Now you're tuning in, so... Uh, yeah, you, you, God, why do I do this? The same reason we do our prayer times and our prayer events. God said, you want people to pray, pray with them. Quit pray, talking about prayer. Quit preaching about prayer. Quit preaching about reading your Bible. Read the Bible. The Bible says, the scripture says, Paul told Timothy, give attention to reading. Churches don't read. Can you imagine? We're not going to do worship service. We're going to get rid of the smoke machines, the lead guitar, the drums. We're just going to read the Bible. How about that? I respect liturgical churches for doing that. How about we're just going to read the Bible? Why? Because then we let the scriptures speak to us. We don't give attention to reading. We expect people to read their Bible, but we don't read it. We're trying to keep it from being boring. We're coming up with new translations. The young, young single woman's version. The young married woman's version. <laughs> this version, that version. Every other version's a perversion. And, and all this, you know, because we're trying to make it palatable and amenable. See? But give attention to reading. <laughs> We functionally reject the scriptures that we never refer to. Fellas said, if you want to know what God is saying, go read all of the verses in your Bible that are not underlined. <laughs> this is common today in our pulpits, where many times, look, I, there are days I'll sit down and I just put the Christian TV on and I listen all day long. And it shocks me sometimes that I never hear a a verse of the Bible quoted, except for uh, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. They get him on there, sitting there, reading the Bible with his glasses on his nose for 60 seconds. And other than that, you go through all day long listening to Christian radio uh, or uh, Christian television, and the name of Jesus or scriptures are not referred to, <laughs> much, uh, not much less mentioned for hours at a time. Now, what about these animals? What possibly could dietary law say to us? All right. The clean animals that you could eat had to divide the hoof and chew the cud. In other words, they would they had a cow, what has he got? Five stomachs. He eats the grass and it goes down into one stomach, comes back up, and he chews it again. It goes down into another stomach. But he brings it up, he chews it again, it goes down into another stomach. And until it goes to all five stomachs, he keeps bringing it up and he's chewing his cud. We call that, that's a metaphor here in the Midwest for meditation. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? I'll just chew in the cud. Let me chew on that a while. Mm -hmm. And it's like a cow. He receives... <clears throat> And he chews on it, and then he brings it back up. And he and he has this hoof, which is not one hoof, it's a split hoof. That speaks to me of the Old and the New Testament. It also speaks to me of Hebrews 4.12 about the word is a divider. you got to be able to rightly divide. A pig chews the cud also, but he does not divide the hoof. In other words, no discernment. He'll just chew anything you give him. He's just going to chew that up and swallow it down. He has no discernment. Where's I, the Bereans were in Acts were were commended because Paul preached to him and he said, do y'all agree with that? They said, no, but we're going to go study it out. Yeah. My brother told the story of visiting a church in Baton Rouge. I, I've told this before, but it makes me giggle. He said, I went down to this church and the preacher's preaching along and, and he says, do y'all agree with that? And he, they all, about half of them said no. And he kept on preaching. <laughs> wow. And, you know, wow. It kind of makes you think there. Uh, maybe they were chewing the cud and dividing the hoof. The Bereans were more honorable because they searched the scriptures. Let's see if these things are so. Don't you swallow hook, line, and sinker. What Russ Walden or Kitty Walden or anybody says, I don't care what their pedigree is or how well known their names are. That's right. Because your commitment is not to a ministry. Your commitment is to the word of God. We've got to become a people of the book. So chewing the cud is a metaphor in a culture for meditating on something. We must be willing to allow. See, we don't want a pig gospel. Just swallow everything that comes along. Uh, much as I like bacon. <laughs> don't be messing with my bacon don't, now. Don't go there. <laughs> we must be willing to allow the word to rightly divide, including both the Old and New Testaments, and to chew the cud. Man, we can't stay awake through 45 minutes of teaching. 
much less think about it afterwards. I used to test my kids. They hated it, but they got good at it. For years, <laughs> we'd get home, sit down, set the table out, could fix and eat, pray over food. I said, okay, what did I preach on today? And, and they get nailed every time. <laughs> but they got to where they could tell me they started what I preached on. Why? I taught them to chew the cud. I taught them to meditate, to ruminate on the on these things. Man, if we were going to hold a seminar, this is a guaranteed money back guarantee, twelve hour nonstop seminar on winning the lottery. You come here, you listen, do what I say, you will win the lottery the next time you buy a ticket. We would have, we couldn't find a building big enough, and we'd have people there with. Pens, pads, recorders, <laughs> buying the tapes, the CDs, subscribing to the mailing list, you know. And to get motivated, we can stay awake for two hours of entertainment, but we can't stay focused for 30 minutes of teaching. I, look, I understand that. I get that. And there's no condemnation, but do you understand that it points to a deficit? It points to a deficit that's costing us. Mm -hmm. What if that deficit? of attentiveness to God's word was costing you your breakthrough? Whoa. What if it was costing you what you've been wondering why God promised you something and it hasn't come to pass come yet? On. What if it cost us signs, miracles, and wonders? What if it cost us the anointing to confront nations with the claims of Christ? God help me to become that person who doesn't just write that off as well and read my Bible more than the average person, you know. Mm -hmm. The ox, the sheep, and the mountain goat, you can eat them too. <laughs> you see, eating food is a type of covenant. You better be careful who you eat with. That's true. The Bible talks about some folks with such a one know not to eat because it's communion, just like Jesus sitting down with the twelve. You're taking communion with the people you eat with. You better think about that. So you eat the you can eat the ox, you can eat the sheep, and the mountain goat. Think about it. To consume a thing is to spiritually ingest its nature into your own. That's why the Indians, they'd kill their uh, enemies and they'd eat their hearts. The Mayans and the Incas did the same thing mm. because they, were, they weren't just trying to be cruel. They were tr their idea is I'm consuming this nature. I'm consuming the strength of my enemy. The <laughs> ox is a servant. While you say that, um, we've had repetitive things God has said to us about eat the word. Eat the word, eat the scroll, and then we're seeing a thread of that globally through different ministers and ministries. Some of our own people have been giving words, and they contain that phrase, eat the scroll, eat the word. As the word for 2015, we laughed about this because in the, in the book of Acts, the apostles were still sitting in Jerusalem trying to figure out what was going on, and three deacons went out and got on the cutting edge of what God was doing while the apostles were still trying to figure out who was in charge. <laughs> the deacons went first. Well, our deacon went first about two months ago. Seven I heard months. longer than that, seven months ago, I heard something ripping here in our living room, and I came in, and he was eating the book. He was eating the book. Kitty's Bible. Uh, Philemon, to so we specific. The Philemon. So we laughed. So the deacon was on the cutting edge. He was on the cutting edge. Just like Stephen, things. Philip. and <laughs> <laughs> So... The ox. The ox is a servant. How about eating the message that causes you to become a servant? Mm -hmm. Have a servant's heart. Mm -hmm. um, an ox is a servant wearing the yoke and plowing through life. Jesus promises us yoke easy, burden light, but not the absence of no yoke at all. Right. Some people think no yoke at all is the only yoke easy they'll accept. No, it's still the easy yoke is still a yoke, folks. And you're there, and you're there for a reason. You're not there because you want to be. The ox does not choose to be under the yoke. Jesus will put you in positions to serve at the interests of others in ways that you would not choose to do it otherwise. would not be your choice. It's like I tell my employees, you know, they get frustrated on their job. I said, look, there's a reason why you get paid to do this. If you enjoyed it all the time, you'd do it for free. Hmm, you point. see? So the ox, we want to consume the ox nature. What about the sheep? It's a creature of the flock. You need to know that you are a creature of the flock at times. You cannot spend all your time outside the family of God. Uh, John 10, 4, said, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, another they will not follow. If you live out of your sheep nature, or if you ingest the sheep nature, you cannot be deceived. 
Either that or the words of Jesus in John 10, 4 are a lie. I'm not afraid of deception as long as I'm living out of my sheep nature. What about the mountain goat? See, sometimes most pastors and churches don't want you to eat the mountain goat, although the mountain goat is a clean animal. Because a mountain goat, he's isolated. A mountain goat, he's he's uh, spends time in, he's sequestered. He's not there every time the church doors are open. If you look at the Jesus when he had his circumcision, he was attended by a mountain goat and a sheep. There was Anna, uh, the prophetess, who was in church every day in the temple every time the doors were open. But then there was Simeon, uh, the prophet, who only came in once in a while. You could never count on him. And both of them came up, both the sheep and the mountain goat, in Anna and Simeon to attend the inauguration of Jesus into the society of men at his circumcision. And both of them, you see people that haven't been in church for 10 years they're a mountain goat that's where god's got them and they're a clean that's a clean ingestion and we don't need to disqualify that simply because we're not getting their tithe check come on we need to affirm those that are spending their time as hind feet on high places like oswald chambers wrote about and remind them that they're not crazy and you're not backslid you're not alone a big, and you're not crazy a big part of our message is to those that are ingesting the mountain goat and Amen. seeking the hinds feet on high places. <laughs> uh, we have to know when to lose ourselves in the flock and when to draw ourselves aside and seek the high places of God. The deer was acceptable. Why? Remember the psalmist said, as the deer pants after the water, so my heart pants after God. Like the guy said, I said, well, you're just hungry for God. He said, no, I'm emaciated, he said. Emaciated. I'm starved. <laughs> and and uh, to be emaciated for God, never get satisfied. The only fish they were allowed to eat were the ones with scales and fins. Remember, water is a type of the spirit. If you've got scales and fins, you can navigate the waters. Animals in the water, fish, that do not have scales and fins are generally bottom feeders. Did you hear what happened at church last Sunday? Yeah. Somebody said this about the pastor. Somebody said this. Bottom feeders. You know what I'm talking about. Come on. I, I saw so-and-so show up and his wife wasn't with him. I heard they had been having trouble. Oh. Bottom feeders. Don't ingest the bottom feeder mm -hmm. nature. <laughs> you want the to be that fish with scales and fins. You can navigate the currents of the spirit. Now, again, another thing about, about bottom feeders, fish that do not have scales and fins, they just lay at the bottom. Don't want you to do anything. Don't go anywhere. You just lay right there. You just right, lay right there and feed on what the current brings you. If you watch fish and you watch catfish, and others, that's what they do. Fish with scales and fins, they're out there. I am tracking the Holy Ghost. <laughs> People call Kitty the scratch and sniff prophet. You know, where did you go? How come you're not over here? How come you're not waiting for the current of the Spirit of God in my life to reach you? Oh, no, she said, I heard a sound. I heard a sound. And, you know, so she might be in the pew one week, but she might be halfway around the world the next. Mm -hmm. See, because she's got those spiritual scales and fins to navigate the things of the Spirit. You have to give people permission. And you have permission, folks. You have permission to navigate the eddies and currents of the Spirit. Rather than sit there just like the bottom feeder with your feelers out there in the pew, just waiting for something dead to come along that you can ingest. Ugh. Who's with me? We're with you. The last part of the chapter. One of my, I, I like these subjects. Uh, verse 21 through uh, the end yeah. of the chapter. You shall not eat of anything that dieth of itself. Thou shalt give it to the stranger that is in thy gate that he may eat it, or thou mayest sell it to an alien, for thou art a holy people unto the Lord. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's mill. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year, that thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, and the tithe of thy corn and thy wine, thy oil, the firstlings of thy herds, of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then thou shalt turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shall go into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, 
that thou shalt bestow the money. Sorry about the emphasis. Um, that the Lord, uh, let's see, that thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after for oxen or sheep or wine or for strong drink or whatever thy soul desires, and thou shalt eat there, there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. And the Levite that is in the, within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. At the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he has no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless, and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come, and shall eat, and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee, and all the work of, of thine hand, which thou doest. I need to digress for just a minute. I just thought of something. I got notification in my email that the app that we have in Android the Android market now supports chat. Now supports those of you that have an Android phone and you got the app. If you go search for Father's Heart Ministry in the Android market, you'll see it. And it didn't include chat, but now it does. Oh, and we're about to launch a, a iPhone app as well. But I just wanted to mention that because some of you, you know, you might be where you prefer to listen and chat by your phone. You, you can do that now if you go in and update your Father's Heart Ministry app or download it. Uh, you'll see that capability. Now, notice that animals that died of themselves could not be eaten. God does not want us partaking of death. He wants us partaking of life. Jesus had no death in himself. That's why he doesn't kill people. Amen. Uh, he has no sickness. That's why he can't give you something that he doesn't have. God put this cancer on me. No, he no. didn't. He doesn't have cancer. Therefore, he doesn't give cancer. And say, well, he did it in the Old Testament. Yes, maybe he did. But Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 says that Jesus is the interpretive filter or lens through which we uh, divide the word of God today. And if Jesus never put cancer on anybody, if Jesus never put sickness or poverty or death on anybody, then we have to reject a theology that says he does. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what Joni Erickson Tata says or anybody else. And I know that's strong. And I'm not trying to pick on Joni. She's done more in the gospel as a quadriplegic than I've done with all of my faculties. And I acknowledge that. But that's still your commitment, your fidelity has to be to what God's word says. Right. So he said in John 10, 18, he said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. See, Jesus was was immortal. He only died because he allowed himself to die. If he had not allowed himself to be crucified, he'd still be walking around looking like a 30-year-old man, just like Adam. Because there was no death in him, no, no old age in him. He would not have aged. Say, well, but what about them guys that said he married Mary Magdalene? This is just Russ's opinion. So what? See, we codify this whole, this, this medieval concept of the vow of celibacy, the Pope and the monastery and all that. You know, God made us man and woman. If Jesus had chosen to have children and got married, there would have been nothing defiled about that. That whole idea suggests the whole clergy-laity dichotomy that the clergy are special because they're celibate and the laity, which means vulgar or common, they're the unwashed masses that they, they're just not spiritual enough to be celibate. That's garbage. And I don't believe that, and there are people that believe Mary Magdalene wrote the Gospel of John. Oh, they man. believe that Jesus married Mary Magdalene, and that through a line of kings. There's some movie that came out a couple of years ago that was popularized around that. Well, there was a lot of, of uh, factual myth espoused in that, in that storyline. But I don't, I don't believe that's true. It's the clear testimony of Scripture that that didn't happen. But uh, there's nothing vulgar or evil by the fact that that might have happened or could have. He, he had the right to do those things he chose not to but he would not have died when we read or ingest the bible we need to spend more time in the gospels than we do anywhere else i mean i went through a time that uh, for 10 years about all i read was the four gospels and genesis 12 through 26 the life of abraham because I wanted to get all that doctrine out of my head that was just based on Pauline epistles and the general epistles in the absence of the vibrancy in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and Abraham, who was the other guy that cut covenant with God in Genesis 15. <laughs> Hebrews 1-2 says 
that the life of Jesus, God spake at various times through the prophets, but now his speaking through his son. Okay, so there is a, here's the Old Testament, New Testament dichotomy. Yes, God speaks from Genesis to Revelations, but he does it through the interpretive lens, through the book light of his son. Jesus' life is the interpretive lens through which we filter our entire understanding of every other verse. So if Jesus, if it does not fit his character, we reject it, even if we've got scripture for it. Which doesn't mean we're rejecting scripture. That means we're filtering our understanding of scripture through the purity of the life of Jesus, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. That will help you much more than you realize if you'll get some thought to it. Jesus' life is the interpretive lens through which we filter our entire understanding of every other verse. This is never taught. And because of it, Christianity has a very different character than that of Christ. It's like when Billy Graham went to sit down with the uh, Politburo of the Chinese government after Nixon opened uh, the doors to China. Uh, a communist official asked Billy Graham, do you believe in the Christ of Christianity? He said, no, I believe in the Christ of the Bible. What a horrible indictment Hello. of Christian culture. See, it's never taught because Christianity has a very different character than that of Christ. We want to filter our doctrine through our logic rather than bowing to the authority of Jesus' character and Jesus' love and Jesus' own teachings about the Bible. If your understanding of the Bible is contradictory to the character of Christ, if what you believe is not something validated and promulgated by Jesus' life and the acts and teachings, then you need to make an adjustment. Also, and I'm, I'm moving, I know we're running out of time. Uh, it said, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says that we should desire the sincere milk of the word. We are the sheep of God's pastures. But how many times do we get scalded by the preaching of the word of God? We delight in preachers who step on toes and tell it straight. This is in direct contradiction to the nature of the gospel, which is good news. We say, well, how else will they repent? Harsh preaching is not the key to repentance. And harsh preaching is not the goal of repentance. Harsh, harsh preaching is to the Sunday morning service what Jerry Springer is to afternoon television. It's tabloid in nature designed to titillate and bring ratings and crowds. But Romans 2, 4, and 5 says it's the goodness of God that leads men to repent. Don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. Don't castigate people with the problem. It's the gospel, and that means good news. Good news. Lastly, it says that it, it says all of these things that you eat. It said the most holy part of these sacrifices were to be eaten in the temple. 1 Corinthians 3, 7 says, you are that temple. In other words, the study of the word, communion with the spirit that takes place in your own meditation and prayer is the most holy, most powerful, and most desired. Personal relationship with God, with his word, and his spirit is to be much more desired and sought after than what takes place in the corporate or pulpit and pew sitting. That's the holy place, but what takes place between you and God and not anybody else, that's the holy of holies. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to extract benefit from the holy place that's only found in the holy of holies. And it's not taught, because then you become anchored in who he is in your life rather than who he is in the religious uh, structure that you're plugged into. But it had to be eaten in the place that God designated. The place he designated was the temple. And you are that temple, not the building down the street with a steeple on top of it. We're not, we're not doing away with that. There's multiple places. There's outer court, inner court, uh, inmost court, holy place. Uh, you're not an outer court Christian. You're not just a holy place. People that their whole Christian life is defined by what happens in the corporate pulpit and pew situation that's the holy place it's not the holy of holies are you ready to settle i'm not i want the deep things of god that god has for us our dependency is is on god primarily not on other things so we thank you father for our lesson today thank you that we had our snorkel gear on and we went low and we're going to seek your face till we know who you are. We're going to see your words illuminated by your spirit to us as individuals. And then when we know the truth, the truth will surely make us free. Thank you so much. Bless our family, Father God. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you.